。我可以问你一个比较敏感的问题吗？中国没有什么敏感问题不可问的。您觉得中国人有足够的人权吗？人权呢，大家很多时候讲是个西方人的话题，是吧？但是事实上，我觉得我们中国在中国共产党的领导下，是真正的实现了人权。Their collective decision, many in the West see it as just a power grab. This is the difference between the two sides. The difference between the two sides is the difference between the two sides. The difference between the two sides is the All the Chinese leaders that I know, at a certain level, they have all been groomed and groomed and trained and trained and trained and planned for decades, in most cases. 集中各方面的智慧，而后达成共识，而不是我反对你，为反对你而反对你。我们是为了解决事情，这就是中国式民主的非常典型的特征。那新疆它的呃稳定发展啊，是实实在在在这块大地上发生的，这就是我们的底气和信心。那些方的政客和媒体，很多是没有来过的。呃，我们呃在这里生活，我们最有发言权。西藏是从农奴社会这个进入社会主义社会，短短几十年跨越上千年，它有充足的生存权、发展权、选举权和被选举权。在抗议这件事情上，是对我们的自由、民主、人权的中国式的一种的理解。生命安全、身体健康放在首位，这是最基本生存权。没有这个，谈什么呢？ I believe in very much in the very strong government leadership of China and the, the Communist Party being able to keep China COVID free, which is an unbelievable achievement. Dialogue Democracy, freedom, and human rights. What are your definitions, and how does China compare to the U.S.? I'm Yao, and this is China Chat. In this episode, I came straight to the point with three American experts who have lived in China for years to discuss whether the U.S. fears the success of Chinese democracy and why China must follow its own path. Gentlemen, what were your first reactions when we asked you to come for this project? And were there any concerns that could have held you back? And what made you come eventually? I was a little concerned about being used as a political tool and being shown a curated set of interviews and places. But I'm glad that I went because it's important that we have objective views on what's really happening on the ground in China. I'm an independent commentator. I appear on 30 stations internationally. I was not concerned. I think it's important that people around the world uh, understand what average life is like in China. And it was useful for me to see what average life is like in places that I've never had the opportunity to see before, particularly Tibet. And it, it looked like people were living well there, which is an interesting observation, which I think is something important for people to know. David, how would you define human rights and what would you call the universal definition of human rights? Well, there's a UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which lists a lot of different rights, some of them social, some of them economic, some of them sort of classical liberty rights. And it's also important that um, people see that they have opportunities uh, for themselves and their children. Uh, for me, the definition of human rights is not about voting, it's about getting access to education, health care for you and your families. It's about being able to have gender equality and be able to create better economic opportunities for yourself. Those metrics are what I look at. Human rights uh, for me is a civil society that is rules-based, that allows uh, everybody to enjoy not only the necessities of life, but also to enjoy choices as the economy goes forward. So who should have the final say on whether the people in a country enjoy human rights? The people of that country. You cannot force values on others. Sean? The people of one's own country should make the decision of how to define human rights. I believe in self-determination, sovereignty, and so it's got to be the people of China who define human rights and what's important to them. It's purely a domestic issue. It should be a process of development within the country. So of all the human rights the citizens of a nation enjoy, are the priorities different for different countries? 
I think everybody wants to feel respected by their community and they want to feel like they have a say. I think at different levels of development in different cultures, giving people that respect and that say can be done in different ways. One thing we've learned is that trying to dictate another country's system doesn't work. Would you agree that different countries should have different human rights development priorities? Yeah, I think each country historically is facing different cultures, religions, geographies. Um, and so each country has their own definition and they're, they're at different stages of development. That said, you know, I think there's basic necessities or human rights. Um, at the end of the day, we're all people trying to take care of our families. From your experiences, what are the biggest or most noticeable human rights developments in China? for the past few decades? For me, the biggest change was gender equality. In the 1980s, um, the literacy rates were very different between males and females. There are now more females than males getting university educated in China. Um, there are actually more females than males getting MBAs. There's still a long ways to go, but I think it's really important that China becomes the lead in promoting uh, male-female equality. For me, it's a, a laws-based uh, society and system. Um, in the old days, I think it was a lot about who you knew. Uh, today, with a rising middle class that's concerned about uh, protection of their rights, not based on who they know, I think that's the most important. David? Well, the huge change we've seen is a change in living standards. Basically, China's gone from being a very poor country to a high middle-income country. That was made possible largely because of economic rights, people's right to build a business and their right to uh, build up some degree of wealth. I think the next challenge going forward is being sure that everybody in China has that, has that opportunity. And if I may ask, as a foreigner here, do you feel like you have human rights? Are there any rights that you think you should have but don't? No, I, I can't think of anything. How about you two? Actually, I feel quite privileged. I'm as a foreigner, I'm a guest here. If I didn't feel comfortable here, I wouldn't be here. For me, since I've actually spent the majority of my life in China, um, I wish that the Chinese government made it easier for foreigners like me to retire here. So how is China's human rights situation different from what you have read from Western media? Well, I think the human rights situation on the ground is completely different from what you see in Western media, whether it be the New York Times or whether it be ABC from Australia. And they're not looking at the 99% of positive stories. I would love and I would challenge the New York Times to actually write more about poverty alleviation, about pollution, about its COVID response. I think China's COVID response has been 100% the best in the world. You know, we're still able to travel. I don't always wear masks. I wear masks when I need to. The Western media is not showing the, its own citizens the true situation of human rights. There's in part, it's a desire to point the finger at somebody else, but there's also this um, existential problem uh, where the, uh, especially Western countries see the rise of China. Its success is the problem. If China wasn't a success, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Because it's a success, it does represent a threat to some people's idea of the hegemony of not only the United States as a country, but also the system of a democratic uh, liberal capitalism. Thank you. And David, how is it different from what you read? It's totally different from what I read, but most of the books written about China and most depictions of China are not about the way average people in China live. I mean, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen a discussion of what's it like to live in Beijing or what's it like to live in in uh, some remote village. And I, I don't think most people in the West understand that. You would call China's success an existential threat to US, to the US certainty that only by adopting liberal democratic capitalism can a state be successful. It's um, an existential threat um, to everything that we believe in. Because remember, that is the basis of American exceptionalism that we have because uh, we're bringing the world into the perfect uh, system uh, that it has given us a carte blanche to do anything, including uh, kill other people, assassinate, start wars, whatever is necessary. Do you think China should try harder to explain itself so that the West 
or the ordinary people in the West would understand China better. So this existential uh, threat uh, issue is out there. In the end, though, that truth through facts, year after year of China improving its economy, improving uh, the livelihood of its people will speak more volumes than anything that the press, uh, the international press can say. So what does the human rights situation in China tell you about China's governance, development, and especially civil society? We witnessed that in Zhejiang, in all of these places where people were, were speaking up and they were making choices about things beyond the necessities. What I saw in this time was that the government, rather than shying away from it, was actually embracing it. They were actually the ones leading. They were the ones who organized the forums that we went to. They were the ones who were supervising the elections that allow people to do that. So I think there are different paths and that we have to be very careful about imposing our ideas and norms on other uh, cultures. So during our trips, when we asked the locals what human rights are, most of them were immediately saying rights to survival, development, health, education, safety, healthcare. But when we talked to some foreigners, they brought up freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion. So is it the case that the Chinese people are more practical? You have to think about it. China was just so dirt poor, you know, 30, 40 years ago, that culturally Chinese tended to be a lot more practical um, at that stage. Second, I think a large part of it comes to American and Western European propaganda. You know, every time you see a politician stand up, they say, we need to preserve our democracy. The, the bedstone of our liberal democracy is freedom of speech. It's propaganda, right? I actually find the United States, you know, terms like American exceptionalism, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, you know, eating hot dogs on July 4th. The United States probably employs propaganda more than any other nation in the world today. And so I think culturally it's been so ingrained in a lot of foreigners that freedom of speech, the ability to vote, defines human rights. David, would you agree? Well, I think both kinds of freedoms are important. Uh, economic freedom, the, the freedom to build up a business or the freedom to build a better life, that's, that's very important. I also think the ability to feel like your voice is heard and to speak, that's important too. So I, I don't think you can compromise on either of them. Would you like to have freedom first or a better life? I think they go together and they actually reinforce each other. Okay, and I, I'm going to disagree with David on this. I don't think uh, freedom of speech is much use if you don't have anything to eat, if you can't walk on the street, if you have no hope, you don't, can't, you don't have a job, and your, your children are starving. I think the ability for people to think fairly freely is important to having a dynamic economy. One thing we've seen at the local level in China, in particular, what we saw on these trips, is that a lot of people believe they can make their voice heard in the things that matter most to them directly. But my point was that you cannot start talking about uh, esoteric freedoms and the choices when you don't have anything to eat. The reason we disagree on this is that here, having a cacophony of voices does not solve anything. Having a voter box does not solve anything by itself. It's the attitudes of the people, their willingness to come together, sacrifice a little bit for the future rather than to pursue their own selfish aims. Or right now in the United States, you can say anything you want, and they do and it hasn't helped anything. We're more polarized than we've ever been before. Sean, would you agree that freedom should always be regulated by law? And under what circumstances should freedom be restricted and up to what extent? Well, I think freedom is a great term. It's a great aspiration, but there are limits to freedom. You know, you need to make sure that your individual freedoms don't infringe on the freedoms of other people and infringe on society as a whole. So in China, you know, people can say what they want to say, but they can't then go out in a public setting and say, let's go cause social instability. And David, I have a question for you. So it seems that in the US, individual views and rights are put slightly above the collective, but in China, it's the opposite. So do both approaches make sense to you? I can give you a very mundane example. In China, people are willing to live in apartment buildings because usually their neighbors are pretty respectful of them. They don't play very loud stereo music at all hours. In the United States, people hate living in apartment buildings, usually because there's some neighbor who has no respect for anybody else and, and 
you know, play some loud music all the time or something. So I, I think that kind of communal respect for each other is important and we need more of that in the United States. On the other hand, it's important for people to be able to think for themselves and to be able to express their opinions. How would you briefly explain China's democratic system to people who don't really understand it? Actually, the Communist Party embraces uh, uh, democracy, but it's a democracy that is limited by the circumstances they find themselves in. So their democracy is about the result, all right? Having a civil society, uh, the things that David said about being able to live in a place where people respect each other, uh, having uh, some sort of opportunity for everybody, changing things in better ways, extreme poverty. They look at everything from, you know, these kind of milestones, what we need to achieve. Those are ways in which to get things done. But it doesn't, ex it doesn't make it the end. The end is the betterment of the people. Most people just know that the Communist Party is the ruling party in China. But what are the things that are often overlooked or misunderstood? They don't understand the amount of planning, the amount of feedback that goes into it. And in the end, if a, you know, a government exists to serve and help the people move forward to have a better life. And the question that people should be asking, is China achieving this? And if they are, they should study it, not adopt it, study it, find what works for them and do that. In the press, they always say when the National People Congress come, they always call it rubber stamp. But I think on this trip, we saw that that's not quite true, right? You see whether it's Simon the foreigner in Gubei, whether you see it's an Ely with the, the Hue and the Uyghur Muslims, that grassroots views, the opinions of people from even the, the smallest little area is bubbling up all the way to the top of the country. And there's a lot more discussion a lot more debate um, and a lot more thoughtful reasoning about what should China do when it comes to political and economic policies than I think most Westerners understand and realize. Um, China's come up with a different model of governance. Do you think the Chinese government listens to the people and what are the mechanisms in place where people can actually have a say in their country? Well, uh, the Chinese government is the biggest consumer of any survey out there. I mean, they're constantly uh, seeing what people think. They have their grassroots organizations. They have 92 million members who are not all in the government, who uh, work as trash collectors, housewives, etc. If you go to the Pol People's Political Consultative, what they are are ordinary people who are reporting in. So they report in at the top, they hold study meetings, they go and talk to their people. They're representatives of different groups and organizations throughout China, representing every single part. I think there's a lot more accountability in China's political system than in a lot of democracies where they vote. Look at how many people in Nanjing, how many government officials recently lost their jobs or got demerits because they didn't control COVID fast enough. How many American officials, how many governors, how many mayors, how many senators have gotten in trouble for the worst COVID response in the entire world? I don't think anyone's lost their job. So a system depends on democracy, but it also depends on having accountable leaders. And that's crucial to making a system work. I know you wrote earlier that almost every U.S. president defines themselves in terms of the stock market, whereas Chinese leaders have been defining things in terms of people. Could you elaborate? Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at, uh, it doesn't matter if it's Biden or Trump or anybody, they'll, they'll always talk about where the stock market is. Uh, you know, you measure how many, your country in terms of how many uh, billionaires and millionaires you've created instead of how many people you've pulled out of poverty. And that's what China has done. So the U.S. usually champions liberal democracy as an end for all humankind. In your opinion, should the focus be on achieving democracy for democracy's sake, or should it be on serving the people? In the end, it is the betterment of the people, taking care and creating a society. The means by which you get there doesn't matter. The issue is what do you achieve? Do you help the people or not? Don't tell me uh, you're holier than thou because you believe in this and that. Show me, show the people. Where are the results? Don't criticize others until you have been shown that you can do better than they. Some Western media label China as an authoritarian or totalitarian state. Would you agree with either of those statements? 
No, uh, China has a different system, and it's it's very easy to vilify countries who don't follow your particular area. But if you live in China and you understand anything about the government, it is far from dictatorial and totalitarian. The party is a massive party. Uh, they have everything that you've seen today. It's all about how. Uh, there's a feedback loop that's going directly into the government, and you've seen what the results are. So, it's a non sequitur. It's just an easy way of vilifying something you don't understand. If you label it as authoritarian, there's a lot of negative connotations and implications, and I don't think the political system here is negative. I support it. If I was Chinese, maybe I would apply to be a party member as well. It could be democracy with Chinese characteristics, but that's selling itself short. China over the last 40 years has done a remarkable job of being pragmatic. And they should, China should be more confident and proud and not trying to pigeonhole or fit what they've done into you know, existing rubrics or definitions of political systems. It sells China short. You said it sells China short, but why don't you think the Americans can accept that China now has a new form of democracy? One, racism. Right? The United States is rife with racism. Second, the United States you know, is one of the most militant nations in the history of the world. So whenever it sees a threat to its supremacy, it's going to attack. Then historically, whenever you see one superpower starts to get a rival superpower, that's when tension starts. The United States, really no matter what China does, is going to try to contain it try to destabilize it because China's come up with a system that frankly works better for its, for its citizens over the last 40 years than in the United States where there's been pure economic stagnation for the middle class since I was born in the late 1970s. So a view commonly held in the U.S. suggests that a state cannot be a democracy unless multiple political parties are in opposition to each other. Would you agree? No, I, d I don't agree because uh, the, the, there are many countries in the world that function perfectly fine that do not ad adopt the same system. It's a question of whether or not we are going to accept that there are different paths to prosperity or continue to insist that there's only one. Whether a country has one party or two parties or multiple parties isn't real key. The key is, are there checks and balances? So th the United States has run into a logjam that is not easily resolved unless, and this is my fear, they start, again, attacking another nation. You know, the U.S. has attacked over 37 countries since the end of World War II, military bases in over 80 countries. A war is, seems to be the only way the president can unify a country. China, on the other hand, by having one party, they have checks and balances so far, but they're able to unify you know, all 90 plus million party members, all 1.4 billion Chinese to a goal to improve China and ensure that the majority, the needs of the majority are heard. Do you think the Western concept of democracy is being used as a weapon against China? It's not being used as a weapon. It's just seen because China is different, it is therefore a threat. If China was not, it's China's success with a different system which represents a threat to those who believe there's only one system. It's an emotional, faith-based issue. Over the last 70 years, that American definition of democracy, the American liberal democracy, is the only political system that can be adopted because the America has defined everything else as evil. Every country has developed its democracy based on its culture, tradition, and reality. So what do you think would be the best way to judge a form of democracy? You know, I've given up on judging it. You know, in the Clinton administration, they talked about the responsibility to protect, the responsibility to intervene. I've decided that's impossible. Uh, in particular, my own country, the United States, needs to focus on our own problems and stop focusing on other people's problems. So what's the best way to judge a form of democracy and what's more important, the process or the result? You have to judge by results, but there has to be a process involved. China has both. The issue is understanding how the process works to get those results. But there is also this issue about uh, the future. How do you go transition 
and how does the government go forward? And in China's case, you see them adopting these educational programs. Why? Because they are 20, thinking about 2060 and how they will achieve, for instance, carbon uh, neutrality. And you cannot do that unless you have prepare the people who are now children to be leaders in the future. You know, in my 24 years of living here, I've seen the quality of life of Chinese get better. And I choose to live in China because I think that my quality of life is getting better really because of the Communist Party. China should be proud of the political system, the ideology that it's created, because it works. It's good. It protects and preserves human rights. It makes society better.